Okay, uh, moving into this position, um, I understand you, you'd been a defensive coordinator before, uh, so had a holistic picture of the defense, and, and obviously you've been on the staff for for a while now. But I'm wondering, you know, why the move to defensive backs? Um, how new, I guess, is that role in its very specific area to you? And um, what sort of challenges are there, but also what are you eager about in moving into that role? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, it, it is a great challenge to, uh, to move to the back end. I think um, when you're talking about, you know, just from an overall defensive perspective, I think everybody knows that the game starts with the quarterback. And, you know, affecting the quarterback and affecting the pass game is kind of how this league is evolving to. So just the opportunity that Sean and Rahima to have the confidence in me to, uh, to you know, put, pair me with Cooley to uh, help run the back end is, is truly an honor. But it's a great perspective. I was talking to Ejero about this before he left for Denver. It's just a great perspective to kind of look at the whole defense, um, really from the safety and the DB perspective. Um, just how you see the whole philosophy and how 11 are all tied together and everything. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for me. It's a great, uh, I'm sure I'll learn a lot, grow a lot, and I'm um, just really excited about it. Um, in terms of the draft meetings that you guys are in right now, um, obviously you know very well that um, it became really crucial, not just to identify young inside linebackers, uh, but in the draft, but also develop them enough to where they could contribute very early on in their rookie contracts um, in accordance with the, the roster build strategy. You also are going to be facing that with safeties, I think, as well, um, and some of your defensive backs. So what did you pull from that experience, uh, specifically when you're identifying traits alongside scouts and, and some of the executives? And what do you sort of share in these meetings um, maybe not just as it pertains to defensive backfield, but overall as a, as a defense, what are assistant coaches asked to share with scouts as you guys sort of hone in on your candidates here? Yeah, so we do, uh, and really Sean and Les do a great job of just kind of connecting the whole organization where it's kind of an ongoing conversation about guys in the draft and how we see guys and here and there. And we have our meetings, but that's just kind of the, just the set thing. You're always talking, talking through everything. And then we also, um, we do a lot of stuff with the scouts where we kind of lay out what we see in a Rams football player and then whether the traits that we want in a, in a safety and a defensive back, um, we kind of lay that out for the scouts exactly how we see them fitting. And then they try to provide us. All they want to do is try to provide us with guys um, that really we really want to coach and we can make them uh, bring out the best of their abilities. And uh, they uh, the scouts do an unbelievable job of evaling these guys and they just put so much work into it. And that's what's hard to uh, take into perspective when, you know, we've just started looking at some of these guys, you know, whenever we got back from the Super Bowl, you know, a month or two ago. And, uh, you know, these scouts have been looking at some of these guys for two, three, four years even now. So they have a lot better perspective on uh, kind of how the player ended up to where he is. And it's just an ongoing conversation. And um, I think the biggest thing is that we just want to get the pick right. You don't always want to, not necessarily your opinion has to be right. And so, you know, as long as we're just clear with each other and uh, willing to be vulnerable and just talk to each other, I think everything always works out. Thank you so much for the insight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Stu. Hey, Chris, good to see you again. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How's it going? Great. Thank you. Uh, you've coached linebackers or most of your coaching career has, has focused on the linebacker position, if, if I'm not mistaken, even I'm sure some of the you know graduate position assistants you had when you were in co in college as well or at the college level. Mm -hmm. What about the challenge of you know pass game coordinator and defensive backs appealed to you when you were having these conversations with Sean and Raheem when it comes to you know your career uh, growth and aspirations and things like that? Yeah, it's um, it it is a great challenge, and uh, I think you know when you coach from when you're coaching inside linebackers, you do spend a lot of time meeting in the back seven with the inside linebackers and the defensive backs. And really the thing that excites me about the move is just the, uh, the guys in the room to be able to work with, uh, you know, the Jalen Ramsey's, Jordan Fuller's, Taylor Raps, you know, uh, Nick Scott's, uh, all those type of guys, David Long. Um, it's, it's really a great group, um, an experienced group um, and guys that you really want to not necessarily um, tell what to do, but guys that you can work with and decide the best way we want to get these this stuff done. Thank you. 
Hey, Chris, Kalen Jones from The Ringer. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing well, man. Thanks for taking the time. Um, obviously, like the position of slot cornerback itself, I feel like has taken more of an importance over the years. But I mean, I know that you're just stepping into the position itself of defensive backs coach, but for, you've had experience coaching uh, the group before. How has the slot position maybe taken more importance at the NFL level or even the collegiate level over the years? Yeah, it's um, it's really become, especially in college, it's really become he's one of your 11 starters. So you're really typically going to have uh, five DBs on the field, I would say at least 75, 80 percent of the snaps. You really look at the totality of the year. So um, that you're exactly right. And when you look at these college guys, um, colleges are doing the same thing. So that is truly a, you know, what we call the star position, the nickel position is a position that is really taken on. Um, kind of a life of its own and, and exactly what you want of it. And, and it's just really what you want out of the position. Uh, certain teams uh, require that guy to, you know, be a really good man coverage guy. And then typically when you are that, that really good man coverage guy, maybe you might not be as good of a tackler or some of the stuff like that, or the physicality that you might want. Some teams want the guy that can play with vision and be physical and, and take on blocks and stuff like that. So um, it's really what you want. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate here. We got we got a bunch of guys that can do it. We've seen, obviously, Jalen um, is obviously unbelievable at it. David Long did a, did a great job uh, stepping in. And then uh, I'm sure we'll have a few other guys to take a look at. Thank you. Gary. Hey, Chris. Um, is there any kind of, a, I, I don't know, credibility isn't the right word. Is, is there a challenge for you going, because all these guys know you as someone who, you know, did a great job coaching linebackers. Now you're coming into a different position group. Is there, I don't know, a proving ground or any kind of thing that, that you feel that, you know, hurdle you have to get over with these guys to, you know, show them that you can make them better, you know, coaching a different position? I think you feel like that uh, all the time, no matter what. And it's kind of similar because I moved from outside backers to inside backers last year, you know, kind of. Um, so it was kind of a similar deal. And then uh, and you already have a relationship with the guys. And that's the best thing is, you know, I already have I've already known I, I've been here when all these guys were onboarded into right. the program of the Rams one way or another. So you already know them so well. And uh, and really, as long as, you know, it's a two way street where we're trying everything we, we can do to get these guys to play their best to do everything we can to put them in the best position to make plays and be them best selves. And usually um, when you're doing that and you prove that you work hard and do everything that you can, that you can to do it, um, you know, it, it'll work out with the players and, uh, and you can sleep well at night. And is this the kind of move that, um, I mean, I no, don't know how far back you and Sean might've discussed something like this, but you know, this kind of move that, build your resume gives you a broader perspective in terms of whatever may come down the line in the future in terms of maybe a defensive coordinator's position is this something that you foresaw you know uh, happening at some point i didn't know um uh no that, that's a great question and actually just now that you kind of asked that no i, I was kind of uh you know, when we, when Ejero was moving on, you know, obviously we had a lot going on uh, when we knew he was going to the Broncos with the uh, Super Bowl coming up. So it wasn't like we were really too into exactly what we were <laughs> going to do at that spot. We knew we were going to have a space to fill with Ejero leaving and all that and all that stuff. Um, but I never thought it wasn't like I went to Sean or Raheem and, and was thinking like, oh, this is something I'd want to do. Um, Sean um, just called me one night and I think it was more we were looking into how we wanted to kind of fill out and, and some of the guys that we had that we could have the opportunity to bring in a Chris Beak at linebacker coach. Well, how do you do that, you know, type thing. So, and I think just the way the chess pieces worked out and it's a great opportunity to me to kind of move back, move into another position, see the game in a different light. And, and, and it does, yeah, it does. It's a, it's a great thing just as far as developing the whole perspective, I think. You know, if you could just do like an internship and coach every position on offense and defense, not that that's possible, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's obviously one of the best ways to learn the game. Thanks very much. Welcome. Hey, Chris, uh, congratulations, Kurt Sandoval from ABC7. Um, can you tell me when 
you finish the NFL season on the top of the mountain, so to speak. Um, how long does it take before you go, okay, the view is great. Is it a blurry line? Is it a defined line? Is it still going on? It's, uh, it's funny. It's funny you ask that because, you know, you, you're, when you win the Super Bowl, you're behind, you know, a few weeks, of, you know, a month of, you know, some teams, teams are already working. And then your typical offseason calendar and schedule when you do things, I think we started our, you know, our draft meetings, you know, a week later, two weeks later than we normally would and all, all that type of stuff. So um, there is a little bit of an urgency to move on to the next year. But then at the same time, uh, you know, we want to take time and, and enjoy uh, what a great run last year was. And it's always kind of in the back of your mind. But uh, it only motivates you to want to kind of go do it again. And I think that's how we're wired is just always looking forward, um, you know, always focused on the next thing. And, and but at the same time, like Sean always says, joining the journey, being able to enjoy it as we work for it. I don't think it has to be one thing or the other. Like, I don't have to kick my feet up and, oh my gosh, we won the Super Bowl. And, and that doesn't mean I can't work towards doing it again next year and building the best team and the best defense possible. So just a quick follow-up of all the great stories at the Super Bowl. One of them, obviously, Sean, becoming the youngest coach to win a Super Bowl. Uh, anyone in your family bring up your grandfather or any comparisons there and your thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that's a uh, – so my dad and my uncle uh, were able to come to the game. And uh, and so it was kind of – it was just to see how much – how happy they were for me was, uh, was pretty cool because, uh, you know, my grandpa was able to play in six Super Bowls, but he won two and hadn't won one uh, – the last one he won was in 73. So they were saying, you know, 73 to, you know, whatever it is, 2021, 22, whatever you want to call it, uh, that long. And, um, and just how rare it is, how amazing of an accomplishment it is to uh, just be in that position and to be part of this team and part of that great run. So that, that really did kind of put it in perspective, uh, you know, because my uncle's been coaching the NFL for, I don't know how many years, but you know, he's been to a couple, but never had the opportunity to win one. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Thanks, Kurt. Maria. Hey, Coach. This one, just a quick one. Does winning the Super Bowl change your perspective as a coach whatsoever? Uh, I would say no. Um, I think it, it uh, you know, it's always something you strive for, but I wouldn't say – you know, obviously we know the ultimate goal is as a team to win the Super Bowl every year. But I think as a coach, um, you know, I just love having relationships with the other coaches, learning every day, growing every day, and then relationships with the players and doing the best we can. Because all these guys, you know, we're trying to, um, as a position coach, especially, or as a D coordinator or anything, um, we want to put our players in the best position to succeed. And some of the best things, you know, seeing some of these guys go on and get contracts uh, with new teams and, and the, the, to have the opportunity to support their family. And that's kind of what it's about seeing the development. So um, it, I wouldn't say it changes my perspective as far as uh, any motivation, as far as how I coach or how I go about my daily process or anything. I think whether we won or lost, I don't think um, anything would change. It's just, it is nice to, uh, Sometimes, you know, on a weekend or whatever, if we're out to eat, to be able to have cheers to something and always something to have that connection for the rest of our lives. Thank you. All right, we'll go with Jordan again and then Omar. Hey, Chris, thanks for the follow-up. I appreciate it. Um, just a, a quick follow-up to what you were talking about with the draft eval process. Um, understanding there's quite a few metrics and um, tests and things that, you guys run players through specifically for the intangibles. Um, but I wonder for you, if you're, if you're sort of looking at a guy from the perspective of a teacher um, as well as a coach, what, how can you tell, or what sticks out to you if in light of all of those tests and measurements, um, a guy you believe can be ready to go from maybe a mid to late round prospect to someone who can contribute early? Like what are, what are those qualities that stick out to you for that? To me, uh, guys that are smart and tough and guys that love football. And typically the guys that have had that, that we've drafted here in the past, have always been the guys that have worked out. And usually the guys that love football, they're smart, they can process, they're tough. 
um, they'll get be the best versions of themselves. And I just always think of John Johnson. I think of Jordan Fuller. I think of Micah Kaiser. I think of all these guys that we've drafted that have kind of had that profile. And you find that out, not necessarily, you know, I know we take in all the, the those mental tests and the aptitude tests and all the stuff that they do, but a lot of the stuff talking, you know, to their to their coaches in college, um, you know, all the reports that our scouts do about them, you know, and all the, the background stuff and then developing a relationship, even with the player themselves, you can really get a feel um, for who the person is. I, I just know, I know, you know, I remember interviewing Micah Kaiser when he was up like, this is one of the best guys, you know, ever. And he was exactly what we thought, you know, and a lot of the guys are. So when you draft guys with great character, that are smart and tough and 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 uh, love football, um, but from our experience here, it usually works out the best for both sides. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hey, Chris. <clears throat> Great to see you, man. Good to see you. Uh, I am just curious, as somebody who was a part of the staff in 2018 and that Super Bowl run, you know, obviously 2019, the only year you guys missed the playoffs, you know, in, in this era here. <laughs> anything you guys are maybe doing differently, you know, having that season go so late and, you know, things that you might be, I don't know, schedule wise or anything, any perspective from that experience that right. might be helping you formulate kind of the foundation of, of this year's uh, team. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Cause it's funny because um, since the last, so that was the going into the 2019 off season, was really the last off season that we actually had, you know, of, uh, as far as the schedule with the players and some of the, you know, because the last two years we haven't really been able to, it's been just different, you know, with the COVID uh, stuff all going on. So um, it was interesting to kind of look back because we're kind of using that, that was really the last template to use as far as what we did and then kind of combining it with, uh, you know, what we've evolved to now. And uh, um, so I, I just think it's, like you said, there's not many players, not many coaches um, here that were here then, you know, so you always draw on what you learn from, but I, I just think it's just hard to, uh, I wouldn't say there was anything like, I know we didn't make the playoffs the next year, but I don't know if it would, I would have called it because of a letdown or anything like that. Um, I think, I just think there are possibly other reasons for it, but uh, um but yeah, it's, it's just interesting when you think about it. Um, just every year is just so different in its own entity. And you're just trying to get the most out of your team every single year. And that's just, you know, you're always using the past and always using stuff to kind of learn from and reflect from. Um, but this year is kind of its own thing.